Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Courtney Clayton. I'm the Dean of the School of Education. I know some of you, but not everyone. And I'm here to introduce our speaker. Uh, I do have my glasses. He was here with us today from New Jersey, which is my home state, so I'm very happy to have somebody from my home state, <laughs> just saying. So um, Dr. Corinne Catalano is Assistant Director for Consultation Services at the Center for Autism and Early Childhood Mental Health at Montclair State University. She earned her PhD in teacher education and teacher development at Montclair State University where she developed and validated the teacher's self-efficacy for teaching students with autism spectrum disorder in inclusive classroom scale. And her research has been published in the Journal of Early Childhood Teacher Education. Dr. Catalano is the project manager for the New Jersey Inclusive Education Technical Assistance Project funded by the New Jersey Department of Education. She developed and coordinated the Inclusive Demonstration Program, a state approved special education program for preschool age children with pervasive developmental delays and autism spectrum disorders embedded at the Ben Samuels Children's Center on the campus of Montclair State University. She also helped to develop MSU's Developmental Models of Autism Intervention Certificate Program and currently teaches graduate courses on autism spectrum disorders in MSU's teaching and learning department. Welcome, Dr. Catalano. Thank you. So thank you. I'm really, really excited to be here. I want to thank my friend Kit, who is a, uh, a, a colleague of mine. Uh, we were both in our doctoral program together at Montclair State. So. Um, so you heard a little bit about me. That is my background and my connection, um, one of my connections to autism. I'm a school psychologist by discipline and um, I have spent most of my career uh, in programs where I've had some connection to uh, working with young children um, with a diagnosis of autism um, and their families. Uh, I do have a nephew who's 13 now who has a diagnosis of autism. Um, and so I have a, a personal connection and many dear, dear families that I've worked with um, whose children I feel are, are part of my family in the sense that I've known them so long, um, who, who I've known since they were three. And now, you know, for those of you who are a little older like me, I recently bumped into a, a, a young man um, at an organization that I was supporting and um, he had just turned 21 and I met him when he was three and leaving early intervention. So that's when you feel old. Um, but it's just you know interesting um, and very rewarding to know um, students that you've worked with for such a long time and, and, and watch their journeys through school. So I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about teaching children with this diagnosis of autism. Um, I'm gonna use autism and ASD sort of interchangeably just as we go through this. So autism spectrum disorder, which is the diagnostic label, right, that we're, we're currently using. But I may go back and forth between saying autism and ASD, so I just want to set that straight as, as I move forward. Um, so um, I know that there was another speaker here, I think, last month and who touched a little bit on prevalence rates, so I don't want to uh, overdo any information that was already shared, but I'll just touch a little bit on this to just lay the context of of why you know you're even having a speaker series on autism, right? Why why we talk about autism so much? Um, we were talking upstairs before this that I think um, Autism Speaks, which is an organization um, that some people have high regard for and others don't, and that's a whole nother conversation, right, of tone today, but um, have reached their goal, which initially was to increase awareness around this disability category. And I would say they reached that goal, right? A lot of people are very aware of this. Um, but we also know that part of what came out of that is doing prevalence studies, which means that we're counting, right, cases. Um, and while uh, that's important for reasons of gaining funding, Right? and um, for research and gaining funding for services, that's, that's really why those things happen. So the prevalence rate, as you'll see here, is the number of children with ASD over the number of children in this age category that they're looking at, which was eight. 
so in a defined population. So I was showing Kit last night, this is just a map you can see of the purple stars are tracking autism among four and eight year olds, and then the blue is tracking autism among four and eight year olds and the follow up of 16 year olds. So these are just places in the country, New Jersey being one of them, where these autism counts are done. So it's not in every state, and guess what? You guys aren't one of the states. I don't know why, but that's, that's where we are. So, um, and when we look at the numbers, right, based on this ADDM means autism and developmental disabilities monitoring by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Um, so based on the last set of data, which was collected in 2018, but came out in 2020. There's a big lag here of time when these things come out. Um, one in 44, the number we're using currently is one in 44 children um, have this diagnosis. Um, in New Jersey, it's one in 35. We have a very high rate. We were the highest for a long time. You can see now we're behind California, whose rates are one in 26. In Missouri, it's one in 60, right? It varies greatly. Um, and again, that's a whole nother conversation about why it varies so much by state that we could talk about. Um, it it's, uh, has a lot to do with resources and access to getting diagnosed, right? And in New Jersey, we have lots of people who diagnose autism. So our numbers are, are really high. Um, and you can see also that ASD occurs among all racial, ethnic, socioeconomic groups. Um, boys are four times more likely. This is kind of old news, right? Boys are four times more likely to be identified um, with ASD as girls. There was great disparity um, for a long time uh, racially, and that gap has closed. Um, and so um, I think there was a lot of work done in that area to make sure that there was some equity in the diagnosis being given across um, different populations. Um, and then among children who have ID, IQ scores in those studies, what we know is that about only one third of children with that diagnosis also have an intellectual disability. So that's meaning two thirds of the population of individuals who get the diagnosis or have um, average to above average intellectual disability. And I think that's a really important piece of information that people don't always understand. Um, so this is also pretty drastic when you see these numbers, right? That back in 2000, when we first started collecting these numbers, it was one in 150, and now we're at one in 44, right? That's huge, huge changes. And so um, while we might say, you know, now if you're teaching, you're very likely to have a child with this diagnosis in your classroom, you may have been likely to have a child with the same presenting characteristics in your classroom in 2000, they just might not have had this diagnosis, right? So um, it, it has really changed quite a bit in these 18, 20 years. Um, so what is the diagnosis, right? You know, like we throw these things around and I know I have a little bit of alphabet soup here, so I apologize. So the American Psychiatric Association uh, Psychological Association, DSM, right? Diagnostic Statistical Manual, based on behavioral and developmental symptoms and signs. That's another really important thing. Autism is diagnosed by a set of behaviors. It's not, I'm just gonna use Down syndrome as a comparison, right? That that is uh, trisomy 21, right? We know the genetic code markers that indicate that. That's not the case right now uh, with autism. This is strictly diagnosed on a set of behavioral characteristics that we'll talk about. Um, and therefore, it's a subjective diagnosis, right? I can look at those behaviors and say, yes, if I'm a person who can diagnose, which teachers are not, we all know that, right? Um, but that individual fits criteria A, criteria criteria B, they have the diagnosis, right? There's no blood test right, for autism. And there's a wide degree of variation in this, what we now call spectrum, right? It's, it's a very large spectrum, and that's part of what I wanna to talk to you about today, 
is how useful is that label when the category of individuals that fit into it is so broad, right? So um, this is the diagnosis from the Di Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uh, which came out in 2005 version five that came out in 2013, we call it a two-factor model, right? There's criteria A, which is deficits in social communication and social interaction as follows, right? So we have to see these three uh, difficulties with social emotional reciprocity, which means that flow, that dance of back and forth engagement and communication, right? Um, Nonverbal communicative behavior, <clears throat> meaning that reading, <clears throat> excuse me, reading affective cues, nonverbal cues, and expressing nonverbal cues, there's challenges there, and developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. We need to see, if you're using the diagnosis correctly, that there's challenges or deficits in those three areas, right? Um, that's criteria A. Criteria B is restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. Again, this is somewhat subjective as to who determines what is normal and abnormal. And again, that's a whole other conversation, and there's lots of cr critical looks at this diagnosis. But if we understand that we need to see at least two of these four things here, we need to see stereotypic or repetitive movements. Um, use of objects or speech, insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines or ritualized patterns or verbal or verbal or nonverbal behavior, highly restricted restricted fixated interests, and then sensory sensitivities. Number four, for those of us who have been in this autism space for a really long time, was a huge victory to get an acknowledgement that individuals who have hyper, meaning overreactivity, or hypo, meaning underreactivity, to sensory stimulation in their environment was a piece of this. There was a big movement led by um, Lucy Miller out of Colorado to try to get sensory processing disorder made into its own diagnostic category. There was not enough research, evidence, whatever, to get that as its own diagnosis in the DSM-5. Who knows what will happen next time around. But right now, the fact that that is something that we're acknowledging is part of the story, is huge, because the studies that at least I've seen um, by Tom Chuck and Dunn and several other folks who work in that sensory space 95 to 99% of individuals who would get an autism diagnosis using a DSM-5 would also show significant differences, right, in their sensory profile, either, either hyper or hypo sensitivities, right? Um, which means that this is a piece of the story in terms of what's impacting an individual's being. Right, who ends up with this diagnosis, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So DSM-5 goes on to say symptoms must be present in early development, although there's lots of individuals who get diagnosed with autism later in life, and we're hearing more and more about that. Um, systems cause clinically significant impairment in functioning, right? They, they, it, again, if the diagnosis is used the way it's intended, um, it needs, needs that those two characteristics need to sort of get in the way of everyday functioning, and that it's not better explained by intellectual disability. That's the diagnosis. There are three levels of severity, I'm not gonna go into that too much, and part of it is because in the education world, I don't ever see those used. I never see those on a child's IP at this point. Um, so I don't know how much that is being used as part of the diagnostic practice. So the other piece is that you probably know um, is that it's a diagnosis and it's a classification category, right? So and they're not the same thing, right? So there is a medical diagnosis for autism spectrum disorder and then it is one of the 13 classification categories within IDEA. 
in order to have that classification category on your IP, um, you need to have the diagnosis of autism. But if you have the diagnosis of autism, this does not have to be your classification category, right? And that's sometimes confusing. I was um, thinking of a little guy I know who I worked with um, in our program at the university. He was a preemie. He was born with pretty significant visual difficulties, um, respiratory difficulties, motor difficulties. Um, he was not verbal initially at the time that I knew him at three. Um, and by the way, he fit criteria A and criteria B, and his parents got him the diagnosis because it did help them get insurance coverage for some of the things they were looking for. So when we went to transition him, so as a preschooler, he was preschool disabled, right? So when we went to transition him to kindergarten and really wanted to make sure that all the services he needed, having the Commission for the Blind coming in, having you know motor and movement as part of what was really addressed, um, physical therapy uh, services, multiply disabled was way more useful as a classification category for him, even though he did have an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. So I just wanted to kind of distinguish those two things. So Mark Mintz is a medical doctor that we um, have done some work with. and. I love the way he kind of helps unpack this a little bit in thinking, you know, what we're learning, and this is a big piece of the autism world, at least that my center is spending time in. And we were for a while the, what was called the New Jersey Autism Center for Excellence. So our governor had put money into making sure that all the different research that was being done in the state was sort of coordinated, and we were that coordinating center for, for that hub. And what we know is that there's lots of different research going on in lots of different areas in terms of understanding just what is going on for individuals who end up with this diagnosis. Now that we have brain studies, right, we can learn a lot more. We don't have to just rely on behavioral observations. So what Mark Mintz was sharing is that it's really most likely a complex neurobiological disorder of things going on in early brain development right, biologically and neurologically heterogeneous, meaning that kids who end up with, or individuals who end up with this diagnosis are not the same. <laughs> There's lots of difference here. Um, lots of underlying what we call sub-phenotypes, so the way it presents itself may look very different. Um, I've worked with lots and lots and lots of kids with this diagnosis, and I'm sure many of you have too. Some are very verbal speaking, some have no spoken language. Some are very sensory, um, you know, tactically defensive maybe, and some are craving, right, sensory input, right? Some individuals might use um, some different repetitive behaviors to express themselves, right? Um, or use them to self-calm, um, and some don't. And some use different ones, right? Oh, right. So it's, it's really, not that helpful to say, oh, I know somebody with autism, and that means you know about the diagnosis because it's so varied and so heterogeneous. Um, so what Mintz is saying and others are saying is that this DSM classification really should just be one little piece of the story and that we need to have what they're calling personalized medicine, individualized treatment that work for that individual and that are not based on the diagnosis. Right? Um, we kind of got to dig deeper. So interestingly, Thomas Insel, who was the head of um, the National Institute for Mental Health when the DSM-5 came out, he laughed. Um, and part of the reason he laughed was because he was getting frustrated with the fact that we were continuing to use just behavioral observations to diagnose something when we're getting to a point in science that we have much more information. Um, and so I think, you know, in the field, this is where we're sort of headed, is to gain more insight um, and, and to understand more deeply what's going on for individuals who present with criteria A and criteria B and therefore get the diagnosis. So my research kind of went um, 
in a way, to be helping me understand um, a little bit about folks I was seeing as we were shifting and working with public schools where we were taking children from the program that we had developed at the university, which was a very developmentally based, relationship-based approach to working with all young children, and we were um, including children with a diagnosis of autism, and we were moving our kids to public school. And we were getting a lot of reactions of, I don't know how to work with children with this diagnosis. And there fit, felt to me like a lot of fear around it. Um, and so I started to do my research in this area called teacher self-efficacy, right? So this is the definition of teacher self-efficacy um, by Jim Moran Wolfakoy, a teacher's judgment of his or her capabilities to bring about desired outcomes of student engagement and learning, even among those students who may be difficult or, unmo or unmotivated. How confident do you feel to do X, Y, Z, right? Um, and so what I was finding in the literature um, was that unfortunately, many general education teachers, both pre-service and in-service, and some special education teachers, said that they lacked an understanding of students' diagnosis with ASD and how to teach them. I was looking specifically at inclusive classrooms for a little while, but not just in inclusive classrooms, right? The teachers were vocally saying, I really don't understand what's going on for students with this diagnosis. And I think this quote from one of them was really powerful. There's lots of kids who enter the classroom and the teachers don't know what to do. So these kids are underserved. Right? If we don't really understand the core problems with the kids, we can't really teach them. So the question that I had was, well, what do we need to understand? What do you as teachers feel that you need to understand in order to best work with students? And um, these were the five, what I identified as broad autism inclusion tasks that again came from the literature and one of the differences in the lit review that I did was I was really trying to look at what are teachers saying, not what are autism experts saying that teachers should know, right? And so these were the five broad, and I'm gonna just pass out these, um, we're not gonna go through these, but you're welcome to look at these. This is just, Um, these are the questions that are on the scale that I developed that I was asking teachers. So I'm going to focus most on this first one, developing an understanding of the needs of students with ASD, right? Really understanding who students are. And also, um, number three, managing challenging behaviors of students with ASD. But you can see also understanding how to adapt the curriculum and instruction, supporting social communication, and how to collaborate with all the different professionals that are working with students with that diagnostic category. So I always like to bring Stephen Shore's work up. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He is an individual um, who has identifies as an individual with Asperger's syndrome, um, and he said, and I've met him several times, you know, if you've met one person with autism, well, you've met one person with autism, right? Just knowing one person doesn't mean you know a lot. But our center does a lot of work around, and I know a lot of you are early childhood folks here, right? How many of you are early childhood? Okay, great. Okay, SLP? Oh, cool, I love, I love that. I love that we have an interdisciplinary group. Um, so, Oh, okay, cool. Um, so it's really important that we go back to understanding early development, right? So we, and if you saw those letters next to my name besides PhD, I have um, a background in what we call the field of infant mental health as well. So really working and understanding infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, and when we study early childhood, that means we're studying the relationship, right, of the infant and their caregiver. And all that goes on in brain development because of relationships in those early years, right? And that we know that we as a human species develop in the context of relationships. Human beings can't survive 
without relationship. It's just a fact. So responsive relationships are developmentally expected from babies, right, and are biologically essential to brain development. And absence signals a serious threat to the child's well-being. Brain development isn't working in the same way. And this absence activates the body's stress response systems, right, to ensure safety and survival. So when babies are not able to have the engagement that our brains are really sort of primed for and wired for, that causes challenges to development. So we learn through relationships. Early relationships are um, that foundation for communication um, and really help with affect development, gestural cues, behavioral interactions, all that comes out, all that learning comes out of relationships. So what some of the theorists are coming to, and this is not, and I'm gonna say that really loud, this is not going back to what some of you, if you've studied autism at all, may have heard of as Bethlehem's refrigerator mother, right? That it, if, if you go back to Temple Grandin's readings, you know, her mother was told that Temple had autism because she had a cold, not nurturing mother, right? That was in the history of autism a piece of the story at one point. That is not where we're going now. We're going in a slightly, sort of turn that on its head, right? Um, because what we're thinking about is this, and this is Singletary's work, um, and I do have these references, there's a ton of references at the end of this, and I know we'll share this PowerPoint with you. Um, what some of the theorists and some of the scientists are saying is because children, some children, are born with neurobiological differences, right? Um, they come into the world where their being, for different reasons, is not as available for engagement. And so that causes a disruption of adaptive social behavior and social engagement. And I'm gonna tell you a little story that helps us make sense, which therefore can lead to these autism criteria behaviors, right? So if you think about it, it's, if you, um, there's a term called epigenetics, right? The nature-nurture thing, right? So the nature being, what does the child bring to the relationship? And the nurture being, so what happens when that interacts with the environment, right? So um, abnormal brain development, things going on that are different, that make that child's experience with the world different right, interferes with the child's ability to make use of opportunities for social reciprocity, right, that back and forth dance for those early childhood folks that love to study, right, you know that beautiful serve and return we talk about in infancy, um, disrupting that, and this disruption of child caregiver interactions results in experienced, experienced, deprivation of crucial social and emotional experiences. That doesn't mean that the caregiver is not trying to engage. It means that the child's experiencing this in a way that doesn't feel comfortable for them. And that, that environmental deprivation leads to these toxic levels of early stress. So, um, we think about the behaviors that we see are really just the tip of the iceberg. Right? Underneath all this, there's stressors, there's overwhelm, there's all this discomfort that may lead to these behaviors, but that's really only the surface thing. And so, again, this, I want to leave you with this quote of, if you see a child differently, you see a different child. So if we start to think about this from the lens of what are the stressors that are going on for that child, not, oh, this child has bad behaviors, then we're looking at that child differently. And that's gonna impact the way we teach that child, the way we engage with that child, and the way we handle some of the challenging behaviors that we might find presented to us. So um, we're gonna talk about that from the context of stress, right? That when any human being, not just a person with autism, is stressed, their body reacts in a certain way. We don't have time to go into all that, but I'm sure you've all studied, you know, a fight or fight, right? Flight, fight, and freeze, right? Our limbic system, 
our autonomic nervous system shuts down, we go into a stress response, um, and the body responds in certain ways. Dan Siegel is someone, uh, he's an interpersonal neurobiologist out of UCLA whose work we use a lot. And I have to say, this is one of the most useful little strategies I've found in terms of helping people understand when we think about if, if this is my brainstem, right, and this is my limbic system, right, my amygdala, most importantly, and this, you know, here's my amygdala uh, and limbic system, and this is my prefrontal cortex, like that's your brain, well, that's your brain, because you have two sides of it, but, um, and I think about for any human being, if I get overwhelmed, right, if there's, if, if my body's not feeling well, if there's too much social demands placed on me, if there's too many cognitive demands placed on me, if there's just too much, think about what you felt like during COVID, right? Um, that all human beings get to a point where they may very likely flip their lid and have a fight or flight or freeze response, right? That is our humanness. And what we're saying is that for a lot of individuals who have experienced the world maybe with a hyper-responsive sensory system, right? That that adds to the stress and part of what we're seeing, these challenging behaviors are really stress behaviors, right? So we can reframe it that way. Um, there's a powerful piece, I just wrote this piece up here so you can read it, but there's a powerful piece in the book um, by uh, Temple Grandin on the autistic brain where she recounts her mother's story of what happened to her um, when she was trying to bond and engage with Temple as a young woman. And for any of you who may have read about Temple Grandin, Temple Grandin had a very significant sensory profile, right? She, she craved deep pressure, but she didn't like light touch, um, and she really didn't like invasive, you know, face-to-face -face contact, did a lot of, you know, averting of gaze. And so Temple's mother felt that um, if Temple doesn't want me, I'll keep my distance. Right? She pulled away because she didn't know how to connect with Temple. And so that's part of this experience of what was going on in that relationship. So I'm going to read you a quick little story. I just want to be safe on time. I'm going to go over a little bit. Um, that I hope helps explain this about this little boy named Michael, right, who was in our program. He was four and a half years old, and he did have a diagnosis of autism. Um, and so... He came to our program. His mom was a wonderful woman and was very open about sharing her concerns with me. Michael was the youngest of seven children and her only child with a diagnosis. This woman was warm and nurturing. She loved Michael and had wanted to interact with him just as she had interacted with all of her other children when they were young. She tried to touch his face and offer him hugs and make eye contact as she picked him up to cuddle him. This did not work for Michael. Early in his life, Michael had turned away from this type of affection. He arched his back and turned his head when picked up. He pulled away and became upset when his face was touched. He appeared isolated and began to occupy himself by humming to himself and rocking back and forth at times. He also was not learning to talk. I clearly remember the day that Michael's mom shared this information with me. She said, sadly, I feel like he does not love me. She also shared that Michael seemed to love her husband more because he would sit on his lap at night. Our team of teachers and occupational therapists and speech and language therapists, as well as myself as the school psychologist, had some work to do. We needed to learn more about Michael's individual profile. We needed to learn more than his diagnosis told us. One day, Michael was in the classroom and one of the paraprofessionals teaching assistants was sitting on the floor. Michael walked over to her, turned his back to her, and sat in her lap. He then took her arms and wrapped them around himself. He was seeking engagement in ways that worked for him. Our team, guided by our occupational therapist, began to unpack this scenario. She explained that the reason this interaction and also probably the interaction which, with his father were successful Maybe because they didn't overwhelm Michael's tactile and visual sensory system. There was no eye contact, nor was there someone else's face 
close to his. Also, there was no touch to his face or to the front of his body, where there are many more sensory receptors. So when you hear that case presented like that, where's the intervention go? Where does our work go? Who do we work with? Who do we coach? This is an early childhood situation in a preschool. What are we doing? Who are we changing? Exactly. We're not fixing Michael. Right, that, that is our goal, to help Michael learn to talk and learn to engage and learn to interact. But who had to change? Was the adults and the way they engaged with him. We learned from the paraprofessional who sat on the floor with an open lap and let this little boy just plop, right? And in watching that, we learned what worked for him. And so what we had to do was gently and carefully coach mom about stop doing this and stop doing this and stop doing this, right? Because you know why it worked for dad? Because dad was sitting on, nothing against dads here, but dad was sitting on the couch with an open lap. And dad wasn't in, looming in his face. And mom wasn't doing anything wrong. She was being a great mom. It worked for six other kids. Just didn't happen to work for this kid. So a lot of what we're learning is some of these interventions and where we're going and who we're working with is working with the family in how they engage with their child. Um, I also wanted to share this because I think, I, I, I don't know if any of you have in your studies learned about what we call the pyramid model. It's positive behavior supports. It's the structure of that that's used in preschool programs. We're bringing it heavily to New Jersey um, and basically it's a pyramid structure and so at the base of the pyramid we know it's about working with kids with challenging behaviors. We know at the base of the pyramid it is establishing a workforce that understands how to provide warm nurturing care and high quality classrooms with structure and predictability, right? If you don't have that in place, we shouldn't go to any more invasive interventions. So what I loved about this is in this tool that we use with this, this is how we define engagement. And if you look at what I've bolded there, this is where we need to start thinking. So some children served in preschool classrooms might have behaviors that appear incompatible with engagement, such as stereotypic behaviors, humming, hand flapping, rocking, or not making direct eye contact. When these types of behaviors are present, do not make the assumption that this child is not engaged. The interpretation of whether a child is engaged should be made based on your observation that the child is attending or participating in the activity or interaction, even when these stereotypic behaviors are also occurring. Right? So that makes me think of a little guy I knew who I helped transition to kindergarten in a public school in a gen ed kindergarten classroom. And he had a diagnosis of autism. He was uh, a really, he, he, was, he had a lot of language and he was a very bright little boy. He knew lots of concepts in language and was really ready for kindergarten. Um, but during circle time, he would sit towards the back against the wall and stare, you know, maybe at a line on the wall um, and that, you know, when I would go in for observations, the teacher would say to me, you know, he's just not, he's not really with us during circle time. But yet when I watched and she was reading a story or something, he would look like he wasn't paying attention, but when she would ask a question, he would, he'd be the first one with the answer, right? Because it wasn't that he wasn't engaged, he didn't have the social expectations of what it looks like, you know, just like I'm looking all at you and I'm, I'm loving the feedback of your good eye contact, right? We're socially primed <laughs> to do that. That is sort of my social construct of what it means that you're paying attention. But that doesn't mean you're not paying attention if you're looking down at your shoes or looking at the wall, right? Um, and so our understanding of what engagement means needs to shift and understanding and, and really embracing the diversity of individuals and how, what it means you know, to be a learner. 
Um, and then we need to reframe criteria B, right? These restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests or activities, blah, blah, blah. Um, because we know that, again, if we come through this stress lens, right, I would ask any of you, because we all have stress behaviors. This is a whole nother lecture. But if you're ever really stressed, right, you, you had to get up, you don't feel great, you knew you had a test that day, it was a really difficult assignment that you, know, you had a test on, um, you had just gotten in an argument with your mother, boyfriend, grandfather, whatever it might be, and on the way to school you got a flat tire and you were running late, like that stress in every domain possible, right? And you came in and somebody said something to you and you flipped your lid, right? You just sort of lost it. But also, think about some of the stress behaviors you, that you might show. You might um, repeat a mantra that makes you feel safe. I grew up in a Catholic household, so if I ever got stressed, like the other day when I was flying down here and I was on that little plane that was very bumpy, <laughs> no matter how old I get, a prayer that was ingrained in me as a little kid is gonna pop into my head and I'm gonna start saying that when I'm stressed. What is the difference between that and a child who starts to repeat a repetitive phrase, right? Or why do we have rocking chairs? You have lots of rocking chairs down here in the West. I'm gorgeous, right? And yet we make a big deal about people who rock in the classroom. Why do we have rocking chairs? Does anybody know? Why do we have rocking chairs? Yeah? It is a rocking feeling, and it's, and it's working on your vestibular system, right? We all have a vestibular system, right? It's that, it's that system, it's a fluid in our ears that lets us know where we are in space, and we know, again, all human beings, we can play with that, that fluid in the inner ear, and when we rock, it sends signals that calm our brain. Now, if you rock too fast, it's not calming, but that slow rocking right, is a movement that is calming to the human brain. So when people are rocking, it's also a calming behavior. So this reframing of what these behaviors mean, right, um, one of the things I tell my students in my classes is that the worst thing that they could ever say to me is that that student's doing that because he's autistic. Why doesn't that make any sense? Anyone can rock, yep, anybody can do it. And also, autism's a word, right? It's not, it's, it's a label. It doesn't cause anything, right? It doesn't cause anything. It's a set of criteria that we've decided this is how we get to it. But it doesn't, somebody might have the diagnosis because they exhibited that behavior and somebody interpreted it as a restricted repetitive behavior, but autism didn't cause that rocking. Autism didn't cause that repetitive phrases being repeated. Autism didn't cause my little friend Michael to avert his gaze from his mom, right? He did that and then he got the diagnosis. So we have to think about how we language some of these things. Um, and what we know from some of the researchers, right, is that some of these self-stimulatory behaviors may help children with a hyperactive sympathetic nervous system, right, to feel calm. So maybe the rocking is calming. Maybe flapping, right, is a way of expressing, right, we, we used to talk about it a lot as like neurological overflow, right? Um, so, and I will take questions in a second. Flap happy, okay. And I chose not to embed videos in this, but, and I don't know if this commercial was prominent down here in your market, um, but we had for a while this Heineken commercial. Um, and it was a really interesting, it was uh, a group of people who got together at this person's home, 
and you heard all this screaming, and they went downstairs, and there were a, a group of men, and I'm really not trying to bash men, excuse me, but um, they were in like this big refrigerator with all these Heineken beers, and they were so excited, that they were, and they were flapping their hands, right? And then you went upstairs, and the women were in this woman's new closet, and she had all these shoes, and the women were all flapping their hands, and, and we use that to say like, those people were not autistic. They were excited, they were really excited. And so we have to think about what do some of these behaviors actually mean and how do we understand them, right? Um, so I'm gonna, ooh, okay, let me see where I am. I'm gonna skip this story just because I wanna be conscious of your time. Um, but I wanna just come back and leave us with some strategies before we go into some question and answer. So, this, again, comes from a very infant mental health space and early childhood space, this term co-regulation. Have you guys, do you use that term co-regulation at all? Okay, so when we think about an infant being born and coming into the world, they do not know how to self-calm, right? That's not a skill we're born with. We learn to calm and focus and take in the world through relationship, right? And you think of all the things you do as a parent with a young child. You rock them, okay? So you play with their vestibular system. You swaddle them. That's their proprioceptive system, big hugs, right? It's very calming to our, to our, our brain. Um, we, we talk in, in baby voices to them, right? We put them on predictable schedules. Um, all these things we do to what we call co-regulate. And children are born needing to be co-regulated, and our goal is for them to be able to self-regulate. So I know in a lot of early childhood curriculums and programs, we talk about teaching kids to take deep belly breaths, right, to count to three, any strategy when they're getting upset to calm themselves, right? Because kids don't know, they're not born with that capacity to calm themselves. It's a co-constructed skill, right? Um, and so my dear friend, who was my mentor for many years, he came up with this little strategy that we are finding that teachers that we work with, both in childcare and early childhood um, classrooms in the public schools, really love this because it's a little takeaway. Um, and so we think about that one of the ways that, and this is not specific to autism, just FYI, but it, it really is a strategy. I, I like to think of this as a classroom management strategy um, in terms of this is based on science, right? How we help humans calm, right? We use our affect. We know that our brain is primed to look for safety. And so if I have a, a warm, inviting face, that child's brain is gonna to respond to that very differently than if I have a flat affect. I don't know if any of you have ever watched this um, Edtronic still face study, um, but he has done a really interesting. <laughs> um, I know it's, it's given in a lot of psych classes, but he did this really interesting study where he had, um, he had it was a study done many years ago, the mother of a one-year-old, right, do the kuchi reciprocal interaction, play with the baby, and then the mother turns away, and she comes back like this. And you see what happens to that baby. The baby goes through a very predictable cycle of trying to re-engage the mother, and then gets to the point of shutting down. After having a fight or flight response, then the baby just gives up. It's a horrible, horrible thing to watch. And the mother re-engages and we go on. Um, but when you think about what you do to a child, when you give them a still face, you're causing major stress. Major stress. And that doesn't matter if that child has autism or not. Um, so affect, gesture, right, how we are with our gestures if we're down at their level, if we're moving slowly and rhythmically as opposed to big and frantic and scary, right? Intonation, what does our voice sound like? Right, working on that, that warm, 
tone versus high screechy. Um, latency, giving kids time to respond. And this is a big one in um, many of the children that we've worked with who do have a diagnosis of autism. There's a whole body of work that I didn't even go into here um, that is coming out of Rutgers around motor. And there's a big movement in the autism research world to, to understand motor challenges, so what we think of as motor planning, um, that if, if I have an idea, to get to the, ec the motor execution of the idea, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on, right, in the brain, and that there's breakdowns there that can happen, and so when I say to a child, do this, do this, do this, do this, and they're not complying at the pace that I expect, that shouldn't be interpreted as non-compliance. It may very well be a motor incapacity to respond in that way, right? And so again, it can be a real stressor. So giving latency for a child to respond all leads to engagement, more likely leads to engagement. So we, we call it agile. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, we could go on for a very, very long time and I give you lots of references to think about, um, but I wanna leave time and be respectful it's almost six o'clock, but I'm happy to stay and take questions um, if anybody has any. So, anybody have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, it, you know, there's different systems of play here. So, like, especially in our early intervention systems, right, where we're, we're hopefully capturing kids in those very early years, maybe when they're getting diagnosed, um, helping to join with families in, in watching and wondering what's going on, um, and giving them ways of seeing what's, what's working for engagement and what's not. Right, so capturing those, um, you know, those moments that might work, just like sort of we did with that little boy, Michael. I said, like, we just did a lot of problem solving around which ways of interacting works best for them, and then helping the parent see that they could do that. Right, so it has a lot to do with parent coaching. There's a model that's used in um, early intervention that we call the Denver model. Sally Rogers work that's used a lot, um, and it is a parent coaching model. Um, so you might want to look at that. I, I know a lot of programs are embracing that. And again, it's, um, it's sort of turning like who, where the focus is, right? Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard that it's under scrutiny as a being really Yeah. Any, um, yeah, it's called the double empathy theory. Yeah. Double yeah. Empathy yeah. Theory. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's uh, a pretty um, it's being talked a lot about a lot, especially in the autism self advocacy world, um, and in the disability studies world, which I I have one more than that too. Um, and so, um, yeah, so the idea is that we've talked a lot, you may have heard of theory of mind, right, that our perception is that individuals with autism lack theory of mind, right, that they're not very good at understanding or interpreting other people. But the, the double empathy is, is that it's not a one-way street problem, right, that we need to, um, neurotypical individuals need to be part of this dance also and understand that there's something probably that we're not understanding about that flow, right? That's how I understand it. Is, is that how you understand it? I believe so. I was more so asking if you feel was like that or if you observed the like, kind of second thought it was getting because he originally said something about like lots of people or autistic, excuse me, autistic people having a very hard time empathizing and in my experience that's not necessarily true. Right. I do a problem. 
Okay. Yes. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, and and I have heard that too. Um, so again, like it's just you guys, the two of you, right, are a perfect example of there's no one way to understand and even this small piece of you know empathy and, and how it falls on the spectrum, right? And um, but I but I do think that's helpful in in us not just so John Elder Robeson, who wrote the book, um, just looking in the eye, he didn't get diagnosed until he was like in his early or forties. And um, he has a really powerful quote in his book about um, everybody thought he just wanted to be left alone. And he says, it wasn't that I wanted to be left alone. I really didn't know how to engage the people that were trying to engage with me, right? And so I think that's that, uh, that quote to me really helps me understand that double empathy theory anyway. John Elder Robeson. Yeah, yeah, it's called Just Looking in the Eye is his book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my experience, it's like if someone explains to me how they're feeling, then I can, but I'm not very good at guessing it on my own. Mm -hmm. Except, I don't know if this makes sense, but on television, movies, books, I'm very good at guessing people. Mm -hmm. two-dimensional versus three-dimensional aspects of that, too. I, I, I don't know really what you on that, but I'm just wondering. But you're right. It could be that it's over, overdone, right, in two People are aware of it. It's perfectly clear about so. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a that I shared with you um, on those, uh, on my scale here, which started out with many, many, many more items, I will tell you, and my, my dear uh, doctoral chair that Kit knows all too well kept telling me I had to get rid of many items. But somewhere on here is an item, I forget which number it is, um, you know, about helping the child's ability to understand the process. 13, support the student's ability to consider another person's perspective that differs from his or her own. That's a big one, right? That a lot of teachers say they need help with understanding how to support a child in doing that because it causes challenges for social interaction. Right? Um, and so we have to think about ways to intentionally support both the peer and the child with the diagnosis in, in working with it. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think Stuart Schenker's work is very similar to that, and he does come from sort of the stress paradigm. Yeah. But um, he, he very similarly says there's no such thing as a bad kid, yeah. right? Um, that was something we shared um, with some of our teachers yeah. this year, and I felt like we got a lot Yeah, I think the other space, and this again isn't in the autism world, it's more in the trauma, right? If you've um, studied Bruce Perry's work at all, um, he just had a book come out not that long ago with Oprah Winfrey, so of course it got lots of attention. Um, and uh, I forget the name of it, but it's basically about um, what's, it, it's basically this idea is we have to stop asking what's wrong with you and ask what's going on for you or what's happening for you um, because everybody's got stuff, right? I think coming out of COVID, there's a little bit more, I hope, 
a little bit more tolerance for understanding that everybody's got stuff, because we all had stuff uh, during, during COVID. And, and I think so maybe there's a little bit more tolerance for thinking that way, I hope. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Yes. Right, some kids feel. I, I worked with this one little boy who, you know, he wasn't ever just sad. He was sad, right? It was. Um, we worked a lot with his mom about helping him, you know, using sort of a feeling thermometer, right? Get to that place of this is, you know, when your when your block tower falls over, you're like this sad. When when um, your puppy dies, you're you're sad, like. Great, kind of working on modulating that, and I feel like it's the opposite of that, where maybe the, we don't have the range of, and I, um, this is not my place of expertise, but there's not that same um, intensity. Uh, but you, like you're saying, you still feel certain things. Maybe just not the intensity that other people do. I think you really would like John Oliver Robeson's book, though. It's a really, you should, you should look at it. When I look at all that we consider best practices in early childhood, right, is that we're supposed to be child-centered, right, and basic uh, activities are supposed to be child-centered. And so, and we need to take into account the individual rights and dislikes of kids. And so if we have a really good, high-quality early childhood classroom, then that is exactly what we is it as scary? Because we're already making accommodations for, like, some kids might like to think of me. Right. And some kids, I have one of these, will literally throw up if you make an impression. Right? Some kids are going to cover themselves in it. Right? And so, but that's, that's a good early childhood classroom that every kid doesn't need to put their fingers in that paint. This kid might use the sponge right. to, to do it. And that's what um, so I think if we get away from the fear by saying we need to individualize and understand that if that kid walks in the classroom and you know he has a diagnosis of autism, you still just need to understand who is Michael, right? Not, oh, a kid with autism walks in my room. That means I do X, Y, and Z. I think that's where we get ourselves in trouble. Right? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all coming out and spending an hour. I really appreciate it.